Celestial Fruit Once upon a time, there was a man who was completely obsessed with the search for truth. He was so determined to find it that he alternately spent his time in praying to be granted truth and following any clue that he might hear of about it. But so anxious was this man to find truth that he did not bother himself to try to improve his own ways of thinking, and he would never stay long enough with any one teacher to learn all that he could teach him. Always someone else seemed to beckon. One day, this man was walking through the streets of Istanbul when he saw a man in luminescent green walk into a mosque. He remembered that it was said that such a man might be Khuda, and that one should seize his garment and ask him to grant a favour. He went into the mosque, found Khuda near a pillar, held on to his sleeve and said, Great Khuda, man of beyond, grant me the vision of truth. Khuda looked at him and said gently, You are not ready for truth yet. But the man insisted, and Khuda said, Since you have seized my sleeve, and because some may one day benefit from your story, I shall let you experience truth, but your fate will be upon your own head. Khuda conducted the seeker to a certain house. There, in a special room, they spent some time in contemplation. Then Khuda took the eager disciple to meet a mysterious robed figure dressed like a king and together they travelled in a mysterious boat for illimitable distances, visiting places which one could never describe, and seeing things which man has in the past only dreamed about, but which really do exist in the reality of realities. One day the man said to the king, I feel that I would like to return to visit my kindred and see how man has behaved since I have been away. The king said, Holy Hida, my representative, has already told you that you were not ready for truth. Now you have arrived at the condition in which you may find that you have not understood that there is the eternal and the temporary. If you return now, you will find that there is seemingly nothing left of what you knew. What talk is this? asked the man. For was it not only a few months ago that I left my own village? May I not see my own family again? How can things change in such a space of time? The king said, You will find out, but you will never now be able to return to us, and truth, although you have found it, is of no use to you. Perhaps if others can hear of these facts through you, however, it may help you in some way at some time. With these cryptic remarks, he gave the disciple a celestial fruit, saying, Eat this when you have no other course open to you. And he instructed one of his lieutenants to return the traveller to his home. When he arrived there, he found that endless ages had passed. His house was a ruin, and there was hardly anyone who could understand his language. People crowded around him, and he told them his story. They thought that he was either a deranged saint, or someone who had descended from heaven. He could make nothing of the mystery as to why he had not himself aged during what turned out to be many thousands of years' absence. And so, in his perplexity and dissatisfaction, he ate the celestial fruit. No sooner was it in his stomach than he started to become old, and before the eyes of the people who had found him, he died of old age. Now there are only a few people who remember the story, and they all imagine that it is nothing more than a legend. A gnat's weight. A Sufi once annoyed the scholars of a certain country so much that they vied with one another in trying to discredit him. One scholar spoke slightingly of his ancestry, another of the quality of his writings. A third complained about the frequency of his utterances, a fourth of his silences. 
a fifth of his associates. In short, you will see that they treated him in the manner traditional in such circles. In spite of this campaign, students continued to listen to the Sufi. Their questions caused their teachers continued concern, so the scholars changed their tactics. Some of them went to the king of their country and said, Sire, a Sufi is corrupting the minds of your majesty's subjects. We urge you to do something about him before your own position is threatened. The king was perplexed. Surely, he said, you wise men can encompass his downfall, for you are, as I have frequently seen, adept at such activities. We have tried, majesty, they said, but he seems to care nothing for his name, and the consequence is that people are denying the real value of repute itself. Do you suggest that I kill this man and make him a martyr? asked the king. No, 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 that indeed would be the last thing that we should do, said the scholars. Since scholars are the advisers of kings in this country, said the king, who was aware that he should keep on the right side of these venerable beasts for his own safety, advise me, and I will at once put any suitable stratagem into action. What must be done is to demonstrate the foolishness of the man so that people will not want to copy him said the most cunning of the scholars. How can I do that? said the king. Challenge him with an impossible task, said the scholar. He provided a suggestion to verify the Sufi claim to transcend ordinary limitations. And so it was that the Sufi, passing the palace one day, heard a herald announce, His Majesty has been pleased to declare that he is prepared to adopt the ways of the Sufi, providing that any Sufi can endure physical hardships that no scholar would accept. The Sufi presented himself to the king, who said, Sufi, a nut's weight of demonstration is worth an elephant load of reputation. Will you take my test? I will, said the Sufi. It is midwinter, said the king, and the nights in the open are unbearably freezing. I propose to leave you without any clothes or covering on the roof of the citadel for a whole night. If you are alive in the morning and not even frostbitten, I will accept that you have abilities which scholars lack. The Sufi accepted the challenge without hesitation. In the morning, an immense crowd had collected to see whether the Sufi had survived. As dawn broke, they saw that he was not only alive, but covered with sweat, rolling a huge boulder which he had dislodged from the battlements from one end of the flat roof to another. As the Sufi was brought down by the guards, the people cheered him to the echo. I have created a hero, and you have made me look a fool, you marvellous scholars, screamed the king to his advisers. If I had left him alone, there would have been at least a possibility that his ways would not have undermined my throne. Now it looks as if I will have to carry out a sustained campaign to show the people that I am, after all, intelligent or worthwhile or something. And he sat there, listening to the cheers of the crowd, biting his nails. The Sufi appeared and said, Your Majesty, come with me to the battlements. The king dolefully followed the Sufi to where the populace could see and hear them. And then the Sufi said, Good people, Look upon your wonderful and intelligent king. In order to illustrate to the whole world that scholars who were intriguing for position are limited to literalism, he put me to a test which was really a test of them. I was asked to survive a winter's night on the citadel to prove my Sufihood. But since scholars are capable only of mental gymnastics, the only answer all would understand was by means of gymnastics. When they were alone again, the king said to the Sufi, why should you protect me when I was trying to disgrace you? Because you, your majesty, said the Sufi, were not really trying to do anything at all, including disgracing me. You were being manipulated by your advisers. If I had caused you to be disgraced, you would not have been a king any more. Now, a king who has learnt a lesson is surely more useful than a beggar who was once a king. But you told a lie when you said I was trying to expose the scholars said the king. I was telling the truth, but I was telling it ahead of the time when it was to take place, said the Sufi, because from now on there can be no doubt your majesty will indeed try to preserve our society against such people, and one method which you will undoubtedly employ is that of 
a nut's weight of demonstration is worth an elephant load of reputation. Grapes Do you know the story of Mullah Nasruddin and the grapes? Someone once told him, Never eat food which is sent to you as a gift if you don't know the giver. But then it would be wasted, said Nasruddin. Not at all, Muller. You try it on the cat first. Then what? If the cat dies or even refuses to eat it, you know the food was poisoned. The Muller was very much impressed by the logic and great practicality of this new knowledge. One day he found a basket of grapes left by someone on his doorstep. He called his friend Wally to watch the experiment. The cat sniffed the grapes and then walked away. We can eat them, said the Muller. But the cat wouldn't, said Wally. I know, you fool, but what cat would eat grapes? The Book of the Secrets of the Ancients Sikanda of Balch was the owner of huge tracts of land and master of a hundred castles. He had herds of caracul sheep and forests of walnuts, as well as the possession of a book of the secrets of the ancients, which had been given him by his father. My child, said his father, this is the most precious thing which you have. It will enable you to do things which in these times no ordinary man can do. Sikanda Khan had remarried in his middle years a beautiful, inquisitive and self-willed woman named Gulbadan, or rose-bodied Begum. As the years passed, Sikanda started to age. He thought to himself, if I could find some formula from the book of the secrets of the ancients which would enable me to become young again, this would undoubtedly be a suitable usage and a great advantage to me. He read carefully through the book and found that there were many things in it, including a means of rejuvenating oneself. But the writing was so difficult and the symbols and words used were so old that he had to go on frequent journeys to what few ancient sages remained in order to complete his understanding of the whole process. Sikanda erected a small pavilion in one of his gardens for the working of the magical process and spent many days there in repeating formulae in all manner of exercises prescribed by the book and mixing the ingredients for the magical drink which was to give him new youth. Now all this time his wife, Gulbadan, was becoming more and more curious about what he was doing. According to the ancient science's laws, however, Sikanda could not tell her the purpose of his actions on pain of failure. He kept the pavilion securely locked and allowed nobody to go near it. Sikanda followed the instruction of the book to the letter. And he imported all sorts of rare and interesting playthings and luxuries for Gulbadan, so that her curiosity might be diverted, and in the hope that she would become less anxious about his activities. In order to maintain his own tranquillity, as the book suggested, he engaged himself upon his business and tribal affairs most thoroughly, in addition to attending to the needs of the ancient wisdom. When the time came that he had completed the processes all but one, Sikanda followed the book's command to go on a pilgrimage to a very distant place in order to hear what was to be said to him by whatever adept happened to be in residence there. Sikanda made Gulbadan promise not to approach nor to let anyone enter the Pavilion of Secrets. When he arrived at the shrine, he said to the sage who was presiding over it, Master, I am Sikanda of Balkh, and my affair is such and such. And my problem is that I cannot carry out the last part of the process. 
for the book of the ancient wisdom tells me to do something which is against the behaviour of dervishes, and which is not consistent with chivalry, and which is forbidden by the holy law. The sage said, My child, the wisdom of the ancients is in arranging and not in commanding. The passage in your book does not recommend you to do anything. It tells you to come on this pilgrimage, and it tells you that a certain ingredient will be needed. It does not say that you have to obtain the ingredient any more than it tells you to pray at the shrine. The prayer is your invention, and the procuring is your own assumption. Each process must go step by step. I advise you to return to your home now that you have fulfilled the recommendation of the book. These words confused Sikanda. If an ingredient was needed, who was to obtain it other than himself? If he was to visit a shrine, what was he to do other than pray there? But he still retained his determination and his respect, so he kissed the hand of the sage and made his difficult way homewards. Meanwhile, Gulbadan had told her maid about the locked pavilion. She had not said what she thought it was for, but thought, I must tell someone something about this, otherwise I shall burst. The maid told a servant whom she met in the bazaar, and this woman told her son, who was a locksmith, some Sikanda Khan, who is on a pilgrimage, has a vast treasure or something else of priceless worth locked in a garden pavilion. The locksmith, whose name was Kufsaz, thought, I shall go and see what I can find out about this matter. With my skills, I can open and afterwards shut the door so that nobody will know what I have done. Therefore, there will be no damage. Now, this does not mean theft. It means information. So he went to the pavilion at dead of night. As soon as he touched the lock of the door, however, something seized him, and he fell to the ground, writhing and howling in agony. When the lady of the house walked into the garden the following morning, she found the dead body of the locksmith stretched before the pavilion door. The matter was reported to the superintendent of police, who decided that the man had died naturally during an attempted burglary. Now, a few days later, Sikandar Khan arrived home. He went straight to the pavilion before entering the house, took the substances which were the results of his efforts, and set fire to them. He said to himself, The wisdom of the ancients is indeed profound. It teaches how a man may attain certain desired ends, but it also shows how impossible it is for him to reach them, because he is not able to do the things which are stipulated. Then he went to see his wife, and after he had given her the presents which he had brought, and seen his children, and ordered bonfires, sword dancing, and feasting in thanksgiving for his safe return, he sat alone and at ease with her. Sikandar Khan told his wife, since I have abandoned my foolish project in the pavilion, I may now assuage the pain of your curiosity. I was trying to produce from the Book of Wisdom of the Ancients something to become young again. However, the final ingredient was something which I could not bring myself to add. I carried out the process as far as I could in the hope that this ingredient had some alternative inner meaning. I hoped that during my pilgrimage to the great shrine, the sage there would help me. But he only said, You do not have to procure the ingredient. So I have returned here and destroyed the whole working of the process. Gulbadan said, You say that you want to relieve my curiosity, yet you have now produced a greater mystery than before. Whatever can this impossible ingredient be? The ingredient, said Sikandar Khan, is that during the last stages of the experiment, a locksmith should be sacrificed.
the Nuristani's boots. Twelve Nuristani's came down from the high mountain passes to sell their butter in Kabul. When they got their money, they saw a shop selling pairs of leather boots of a beautiful kind which they had never seen before. Each Nuristani bought a pair. When they had got them on, they realised that nobody could see his own boots properly because he was wearing them. Wanting to taste the joys of looking at the new boots, they sat down in a circle with their legs stretched out so that everyone could look at all the boots. After several hours, people began to get curious at the sight of a dozen Nuristanis sitting with their legs looking like the spokes of a wheel. They did not even look happy. Someone went up to them and said, Why don't you ever get up? Is this how things are done in Nuristan? No, said the Nuristanis. This is how things are done in Kabul when you get new boots. Then they explained that, admiring the boots and realising that they were all the same, each man had forgotten whose boots were on whose legs, so they couldn't stand up. That's easy enough, said the Kabuli. He brought a stick and gave each of the peasants a clout with it, causing them to scramble to their feet. This is the origin of the Nuristani custom of beating anything of uncertain ownership to see whether it will run to its master. The Magic Mountain In my mana lived Abdul Wahab, the son of a villager, and a man who decided that he should follow the precept of the wise, where they have said, service is superior to advice, but action is better than anything. Abdul Wahab heard the villagers saying that they would not long be able to continue paying the heavy taxes demanded by their Khan, that the great dam upon the hill which supplied water for their valley would one day collapse, and they badly needed a new mosque. He also noticed that the local wise man, whose name was Pishki, used to say every time he heard any of these complaints, if only one of you would follow my advice, all these problems would be removed from you. Abdul Wahab's decision was that he would take the advice and that he would carry out whatever actions were recommended by the sage. So he went to Pishki and said, May I be your sacrifice. I am a member of this community and I await your commands if you wish to give any orders which will enable the whole village to be saved. Pishki said, You have not much time, so be prepared to start at once. This is what you must do. You will climb the highest mountain and bring down the feather of the greatest eagle. This you must take to the Humai bird, who will give you a spear. You must cut yourself with a spear and give some of the blood to someone as a charm. Then you must take ordinary bread and model it in the form of a man and have someone eat it. After that, you must journey to a place called the Holy. There you will say things that people do not like. Never mind what they are. Whatever the people believe, tell them the opposite. When you have done all these things, return to the village, and you will find that your actions have affected matters in such a manner that all is well, and the problems which overshadow us have been removed. Abdul Wahab did everything, just as it was detailed to him, although it took three years. He had one adventure after another, and even attracted numerous disciples, since his repute as the enigmatic sage and the man with a sense of purpose had such an effect upon so many people whom he met. Then he returned to the village. He said to the first villager whom he met, I have just come from far away and have brought down from the highest mountain the feather of the greatest eagle. This I gave to the Humai bird in exchange for a spear. The villager said, Madman, we have no time for such as you. We are preparing a celebration, for the villainous Khan is dead. That was my doing, shouted Abdul Wahab. Out of my way, liar, said the villager. Then Abdul Wahab saw the local holy man. Mullah, he said, I have to report that we may expect through my exertions that the dam on the hillside will not now collapse. 
The mullah looked at him sadly and said, My son, you have been absent a long time, and it seems as if your wits are absent still. While you were away, the streams filling the dam dried up. We found that the old wells near the village were full of water instead, so we do not care whether the dam collapses or not. That was my doing, shouted Abdul Wahab. Yes, yes, said the mullah, humouring him. Then Abdul Wahab saw the imam of the local mosque. Imam, he shouted, you need not now wait for a new mosque, for you will have one almost at once, since I have arranged it through my exertions. The imam said, we do not need a second new mosque. Abdul Wahab exclaimed, you haven't got a first new mosque yet. But we have, said the imam, for while you were away, there was a rich man who came and handed us many bags of gold for a new mosque. It was on the day that I found a piece of bread modelled into the form of a man. I told the rich man, and he said, if there are such idolaters around, you should have a new mosque. It was my doing, said Abdul Wahab but nobody would believe him. Abdul Wahab went to see the sage Pishki about the matter, but when he reached the old man's house, he found that he was dead. The Boy Who Had a Dream There was once a boy named Haida Ali Jan, whose tutor was a wise old dervish. His father sent him every day to the house of the dervish, who knew almost everything. But all the dervish would teach Haida was, When you have a dream, and remember it when you wake up, never tell it until someone says, May you live forever. When the dervish had been teaching him for some time, Haida's father said, Is the wise one instructing you in many sciences? No, said Haida. He is repeating only a single lesson about dreams. About dreams, indeed, said his father. He stopped the boy going to any more lessons. He went to see the dervish and said, Why have you wasted my money and my son's time teaching him only one thing, and that about dreams of all things? The dervish said, I teach every student what he needs in his life preparing him for the most important experience which is to befall him. But the father was not satisfied. The explanation made no sense to him. You are as bad as the charlatans who pretend that a single exercise, if persevered in, can be applied to all men, he said. Only you are slightly more sophisticated. Not long after this, Haida had a dream. The next morning, he told his mother... She asked him what kind of dream it had been, but since she had not first said, May you live forever, the boy could not tell her. She became quite angry and sent him to his father. What do you want? asked his father. Last night I had a dream, said Haida, and when I mentioned it to my mother, she got angry and sent me to you. What was the dream? said the father. Because he did not say, May you live forever, Haida said, I cannot tell you what my dream was. So his father became angry with him and said, You know the tree at the crossroads where nobody ever passes? You shall go and sit in the branches of that tree as a punishment for refusing to answer a question. Haida set off and climbed the tree. He had not been sitting there long when two travellers stopped in the shade to share a meal. One said to the other, the king has sent for me to answer a conundrum. I cannot understand it, but I dare not refuse to appear at court. If only the earth would open and receive me so that I might disappear from the sight of men. If only someone could be sent from above who could answer this question so that I need not. The other traveller said, What is this insoluble riddle? The riddle said the first traveller, is this. There are two pieces of wood, and the king, for some purpose of his own, wants to know which of them is made from the root of a tree and which from a bough. 
Haida jumped down from his branch and said, Take me to the king. You may indeed have been sent from above, said the astonished traveller. So I shall take you with me. When they arrived at the gates of the king's capital, Haida said to his companions, Buy a goat, a donkey and a camel. At the entrance to the palace, the three were stopped. We can only let the first traveller in, for he alone has an invitation from the king. The first traveller entered, and he said to the king, I cannot answer your question, sir, without my companions. The king said, If they can satisfy the Rais Itashrifat, the chief of ceremonials, let them be brought in. The scholars, who had been unable to answer the king's question about the pieces of wood, feared that these newcomers might provide the solution. They said to the Rais Itashrifat, Here are some questions for the visitors. If they cannot answer, you can exclude them from the court, on the pretext that they lack the necessary finesse. The Rais called Haida and the other traveller, who came forward leading their animals. He said, You are not big enough to know how to answer a question. Haida said, The camel, who is as of our party, he is big enough. A camel was large enough for the prophet. The Rais said, You have no beard. How can you know anything? Haida said, The goat has a beard, if beards are needed. The Rais said, You are not a man. Haida said, If a man is needed, here is one. And he pointed to his companion. The Rais said, How can you bear the weight of the responsibility of knowledge, you puny weakling? Haida said, Here is another member of our group, a donkey. An ass was fit for the responsibility of carrying Jesus. People were laughing, and the Rais did not want to appear more foolish. So, muttering, Let the pedants look to their own worries, he led Haida through to the audience hall. When he arrived before the throne, Haida said, Where is the wood? Two sticks were brought, and Haida called for a bowl of water. He threw the wood in. One stick floated. That is from the branch, said Haida. The other sank. Haida said, And that is from the root. The king was amazed, for Haida had divined the roots correctly. He said to Haida, How did you come upon such an art? It has been prophesied that the man who can tell one stick from another will become my prime minister and save our community from peril. Haida said, Glorious Majesty, I had a dream. May you live forever, said the king. And what was the dream? The dream, said Haida, was that I was called upon to discover which stick was from a root and which from a branch and that I solved the problem in the manner which you have just seen. Belief A Sufi was once faced with a band of visitors who had travelled an immense distance to sit at his feet. Their belief in his perfection and infallibility had given them strength to scale mountains, cross deserts, navigate oceans and endure all the hardships which had been their lot. When they arrived in his presence... They threw themselves on their faces before him, begging to be allowed to devote themselves exclusively to his service. Do you believe in me, and in whatever I might say? the Sufi asked them. They answered, We do everything and implicitly. Very well, said the Sufi. I shall now test the depth of that belief. Test us, master, cried the devotees. The Sufi continued, Now listen to this claim. I am not here at all. Can you believe that, implicitly? The would-be disciples hesitated, and then, one by one, they confessed that they were unable to believe that he was not there. The Sufi said, Although you've been motivated and sustained by feelings, you are really men of words. Your feelings cannot keep pace with your words. You say, I can believe anything, which is words. When you are asked to believe something, you cannot, which shows the lack of deep feelings. You are false even to your own assertions. 
Camel's Head Ajib the thief one day found a camel's head on a rubbish dump. He took it home and wrapped a piece of silk around it and took it to the market to sell. The silk merchants looked at the bulky parcel and one after another offered him such a low price that it was no more than the worth of the actual silk without the bulk represented by the camel's head. All right, said Ajib at length to one of the rascally merchants. I'll accept your price, which seems fair enough to me. The man is a fool, thought the merchant. Aloud, he said, Is there anything inside the silk to bulk it out? Ajib said, Camel's head. The merchant thought, He's getting angry, so I'd better pay him quickly in case he sells this heavy bundle to someone else. So he paid Ajib. Some days later he saw Ajib in the street and took him at once to the summary court, charging him with false pretenses. When you were asked whether there was anything inside that bundle, why did you say no? asked the merchant. You may have heard me say no, but what I actually said was camel's head, said Ajib. I imagine that you heard me through your greed, not your ears. Case dismissed. The Horse Khan, Son of a Khan Once upon a time there was a great Khan, and this Khan had three beautiful daughters. The first was called Silk, the second was called Pearl, and the third, the youngest, was called Zephyr. One day, the Khan said to the three girls, Come, daughters, it is time that you were married. The first shall marry my court poet, who is also a great swordsman. The second shall marry my standard-bearer, who is also a valiant knight. As to the third one, well, I'll think about that later. The first two girls were duly married and the celebration of their weddings occupied twice forty days and forty nights with sherbets and bonfires, feasts of jollity, gifts, and everything else that could make a great occasion. Then the Khan said to some of his men, I am tired of all this frivolity. I think I shall go hunting. So they all set out, accompanied by a splendorous retinue, and arrived at a ruined castle on a hill. We shall camp here for the night said the Khan. But no sooner had he laid himself down to rest than a huge dev, a giant ogre, came rising straight out of the ground and towered in front of him. Peace upon you, muttered the Khan. How fortunate that you should have saluted me. If you had not, I would have eaten you alive, roared the dev. What can I do for you? asked the Khan. There is, alas, nothing anyone can do for me now, said the dev, because I've been trapped in a deep well just below where you were sleeping, and I'm only allowed out at night when there's nobody awake to terrorise. I'm glad about that, said the Khan. But who is it that has the power to catch and imprison the enemies of man in this amazing manner, since Suleiman, the son of David, upon whom be peace, is no more upon the earth? Do you remember the meek dervish who called and saluted you during your daughter's wedding celebrations? asked the dev. Well, it was him. That dervish? exclaimed the Khan. But he did nothing to me, although I did not obey his instructions in any particular. You have a second chance, said the dev, because he always tells one twice. He told me to give up my abominable ways twice, too, but I did not believe he had any powers. So saying, the dev gave a deep sigh. I must return to my well now, he said, and sank back into the ground. The next morning, the Khan awoke at dawn and immediately returned to his capital. No sooner had he sat down in his audience chamber and the drums announcing the Durba began to beat, then the same inoffensive-looking dervish presented himself for an audience. O Khan, 
he said. I have come to give you a present. You have married your daughters off in haste. I agree that it was to worthy men, but it was without consulting a dervish. Yes, said the Khan. I'm sorry about that. Well, said the dervish, you now have another chance, but it will be a hard one. Take this horse and marry your last daughter to it. The Khan was not sure whether he could believe his ears, but he decided that he should do as he was commanded. So he sent his daughter to the horse's stable and made her live there. What he did not know, however, and neither did anyone else, was that as soon as Zephyr entered the stable, it was transformed into a beautiful and luxurious bower. And the horse was really a magical man, a youth who could change into human form again only when he was with a beautiful maiden. I am myself a Khan and the son of a Khan, he told her, and I am here to teach trustworthiness. This is the only way in which it can be done. Remember, therefore, that no matter how tempted, you must never disclose that I am a man. Zephyr promised him, and even when there were rumours that she was married to a horse, she said nothing. Now, the day came when the Khan announced the annual feast and fair at which the most valorous men in the land were to compete in feats of arms. The ladies, pearl and silk, looked admiringly upon their husbands as they rode into the arena mounted on wonderful chargers to defend their titles as the foremost warriors in the land. We have heard something about your husband, sister, they said to Zephyr, but perhaps this is a time to watch manly daring and admire excellence in combat rather than talk of mysterious things. In bout after bout, contest after contest, the court poet and the standard bearer overcame their opponents. The applause was heard from Herat to Badakhshan, and the clanging of spears, the buzzing of arrows, the clash of swords was mingled with the thundering of hooves and the flashing of accoutrements as the champions prevailed again and again against the men of all High Asia. But as one bout followed another, as one gasp of excitement, one round of applause, one cry of triumph followed another, Bibi Zephyr found herself more and more wishing that she could say that her husband was a Khan, a son of a Khan, and could, if he wished, beat all comers on the field that day. The contests were to last three days, and on the second night, the horse Khan said to his wife, Khanum, I shall take the field tomorrow. I know how much you have yearned to see me acquit myself. Tomorrow you shall. But let me warn you, this will be a severe test for both of us. Tell nobody that I am your husband, no matter how strong the temptation. But if anything should go wrong, take these three horsehairs. If you need me, burn one of them. Remember, though, there are only three of them. The next morning, as the heralds were announcing the names of the champions left in the contests, a strange knight with a steel skullcap and a crimson turban almost covering his face rode into the arena. When Zephyr saw that his banner showed only a huge horseshoe, she knew that it must be her husband. The horse Khan took on his two brothers-in-law both at once, wrestling on horseback and with the blunted lance, the long sword and the dagger. He vanquished both of them in minutes. Zephyr's sisters were half in tears and half excited to know who the mysterious stranger was. As he went on to dispose of all the champions, sometimes one by one, sometimes in groups, Zephyr could not restrain herself any longer, and she said to her father, That is the Khan, the son of a Khan, and he is my husband, married to me in the form of a horse. He is a magical man, here to try our patience. The Khan, remembering that the horse had been given to him by the dervish, said, This is a serious business, daughter. You have broken your word and failed the test. I fear for you and for us, for it is we who have trained you so badly that faults have become apparent under stress. As he said this, the horse Khan left the field. That evening, when she went to her apartments, the Bibi Zephyr found a letter from her husband. It said, I knew by the weakness which seized me on the field today that you have told someone my secret. I have had to go, and I may never see you again. Zephyr was beside herself with grief. But suddenly, 
she remembered the three hairs and burned one. Immediately, the dev, which her father had seen on the hunting trip, appeared. I did not want you, said Zephyr. You must have been thinking some evil thought as you burned that hair, said the dev, because that is how these things work. How can I get rid of you? asked Zephyr. Only by calling the dervish, said the dev. Zephyr used her second hair to make the dervish appear. Within a few seconds, he had banished the dev to his well and had himself vanished. Then Zephyr thought as hard as she could, and finally burned the third hair, asking for her husband to come. When he appeared, he said, Now there is no more that we can do. I am no longer a horse, but an ordinary man and a Khan son of a Khan again. Oh, sure, we can now live happily until the end of our days. But never forget that if we had been able to use the three magical hairs more productively and not spent them on our own welfare, it would have been better for everyone. <laughs>